Love Bites, Love Bleeds, it's bringing me to my knees. Welcome to Love Bites, a dating simulator with uh, some very interesting horror themed elements. Uh, I don't have a lot of ways to describe this except to uh, jump right into it, so hopefully everyone uh, enjoys this. And uh, maybe we can uh, make some monster matchmaking. Let me check my options first. Okay. Back to the main menu then. Okay. So we have the option at first to play as Brandon or Caitlin. They have but they both have access to all love interests, but the romance will be different depending on who you choose. So, who would we like to be? Again, this is going to be the thing, uh, the, and the thing. This is going to be a, uh, everybody has their say thing, so please, uh, by all means, let me know what you think. Caitlin. I'm fine with that. I like Caitlin better, because, you know, I like playing female protagonists. Eh. Darkness surrounds you, the chill of the night causing small, small clouds of mist to form with each exhalation of your deep, ragged breaths. You take a moment to lean up against a streetlight to gather, gather your breath and collect your thoughts. Your eyes furtively look down the street, but for the moment all is calm. And then suddenly Michael Jackson's thriller breaks out. You glance upward as you hear a slight sizzle, the smell of smoke filling your nostrils, and the lights go out. Panic rises, then recedes as the lights return, dimmer than before. Then you hear something coming down from one end of the street. Shadows slowly appear, moving even closer to you, when a faint sound filters into your ears. Growl. You glance down at the other end of the street, and shadowy figures suddenly come into sight. Your avenues of escape are suddenly cut off. Except, of course, a big street behind you, but, you know, who's counting that? As the shadows advance, you see each streetlight give a final flicker and then die, enveloping the street in encroaching darkness. You take a glance around and see a small alley. You feel a surge of adrenaline as you sp sprint into it, only to see that it ends in a brick wall. Apparently so. Apparently she has. Your head whips around as the growls get even closer while the lights are all but gone. You press up against the brick wall when you see a fire escape overhead, the rungs of its ladder just barely out of reach. Near the ground, there's a window leading into a basement in a space you just might be able to crawl into. Climb the fire escape or break the window. Oh my god, Becky. <laughs> Alright, climb the fire escape or break the window. Fire escape. Okay. You stand on your tiptoes and find the fire escape is agonizingly just out of your reach. You look in the alley for something to stand on, but there is nothing. With great fear, you jump, your fingers brushing the bottom of the ladder, only to fall back down. Called it. Glancing out of the corner of your eyes, you see the shadowy figures slowly coming your way, their incoherent growls drawing closer. With great desperation, you give a final jump and sla snag the ladder, slowly drawing yourself up. Yes, slide the ladder, turn it into molten metal, and then climb it. Good, good choice. When you feel slick, scabrous hands slide along your legs. You try to escape, but feel yourself being pulled back. Yeah. Your vision stays fuzzy for several moments as your head feels like it was wrapped in cotton. You notice a small dark blur at your feet, pulling te teasingly on your leg. It senses your awakening and gives a slight joyous yip that nevertheless causes you to wince in pain. Ugh, time to get up. I'm pretty sure this is as much as you get on, uh, on this, so I should be fine. Your eyes focus and you see a rather energetic dog at your feet, happy to see you awake. As you wipe away the last effects of sleep, the dog darts forward and jumps into your arms, licking at your face before nestling into your arms. Nick, remind me not to stay out with the girls so late. I can barely keep my eyelids open. Rough. I'm not your friggin' stenographer. 
Nick, Nick's answering bark causes you to jump slightly, but helps it helps drive away the last vestiges of sleep from your head. You glance at the clock and see it reads 9 a.m. You glance toward your bed and it looks like a war broke out between you and the sheets. You give a couple slight stretches, bringing feeling back into your fatigued limbs. Your arms and legs feel like you did a marathon in your sleep, but the reason why escapes you, unable to remember your dream from the night before. Joshua. Hey, lazy bones. Time, time, get, time get up. Breakfast on. You wake up. Eat food now. Your stomach growls at this announcement, and Nick barks back and rejoined her. I'll be down in a sec. Just give me a few minutes to freshen up. As you enter the kitchen, wow, she did that fast. The aroma of fresh cooked pancakes fills the air, causing your mouth to water, and your stomach rumbles in anticipation. Anticip... Pancakes. Well, good morning to you, too. He, he looks so goofy. Joshua looks like such a goof. All right, Rick. Um, I'll see you on Sunday. Uh, take care. Thanks for being here. Have a good one, man. Your face turns red and your stepfather gives you a good-natured grin before he turns to finish cooking. Looking down, you see several links of sausage alongside the plate of pancakes. You see the syrup and butter, but you don't see your favorite jam. Oh, that's, that's the true horror of this. As if reading your mind, Joshua interrupts your search. Um, let me just get untangled from the uh, light fixture here. Uh, sorry, I impaled myself on the wire earlier. I can't help it if you and your stepsister s share similar tastes. She finished the raspberry up yesterday for her peanut butter and jelly. I can get some more later. No need to put yourself out. I can get more later. Besides, you might want to recycle this jar. I think the last person to use it was Brandon. How can anyone like grape jam is beyond me. Or how anyone can like grape jam is beyond me. <laughs> You'd think twins would have similar tastes, so if you don't mind me asking, what are your plans for today? You grab a plate and put a couple of pancakes on it. You take a deep breath and your stomach quiets in anticipation of the food to come. The position I was hired for doesn't really get going for another three months, so I'm a bit at loose ends. I'm, looking, I'm kind of looking for something temporary in the meantime. That sounds good, but it's alright if you want to take it easy for a day or two, and you know your mother and I wouldn't mind helping you out. Thanks, but I'd like to try and get my own place before my job starts. I know you and Mom will always be there for me, but I should have my own place by now. I ought to be young and independent. Still, if you need some help, don't hesitate to ask. Just as you are about to answer, your phone rings. Joshua beckons you, beckons for you to answer it. I almost, I almost dyslexia'd uh, Joshua into a stupid state again. You too far answer it. Mona, there's my darling baby girl. How I've missed you. Mom, don't you think it's a little early, little early to make me blush? Didn't realize that was time dependent. Don't you dare, especially when I'm not there to pinch your cheek. Ah, uh, blushes. So how did Brandon's graduation go? Pretty good, though I couldn't spot him in the sea of pur of people. <laughs> a sea of purple? Wow. Ah, too much. I have read too much tonight. In fact, we're actually going out for breakfast. I just wanted to wish you congratulations for your own graduation. I wish I could have been there. Think nothing of it. I wish I could have seen Brandon's as well, but when both are on the same day, you just have to choose who your favorite child is. I understand. Listen, I have to go. We're going out for breakfast, but I just wanted to touch base. Give my love to your dad, Sabrina, and Nick. Oh, you mean the teenage witch? Just a few seconds after you hang up the phone, your stepsister Sabrina comes into the kitchen. She gives a shy, shy smile upon seeing you and turns her head slightly away when she spies the pancakes. I like her, like, purple and black hair, you know. She just looks awesome. Ah, I should have got up sooner. Sabrina grabs a pancake and rolls it around several sausages and takes a big bite out of it. Actually, Sabrina, that's something I want to talk about. You see... We'll have to talk later, Dad. If I, go, if I don't go now, I'm going to be late for work. Joshua shakes her head as Sabrina darts out the back door. 
That girl, I swear, if she doesn't straighten out, she'll be repeating her senior year again. Wait, repeating again? So that would be the third time? You want me to check on her? Maybe find out if something's wrong? If you wouldn't mind, I would appreciate it. I know she's 18, but... And she doesn't know what she wants. Jo Joshua stops talking as Nick comes up to you. His leash in mouth and he sits up, pawing the air and whining for your attention. Does someone want his walkies? Oh, Sabrina forgot her leash. <laughs> either either seems possible, uh, Misfit. Nick, Nick barks in reply, letting the leash hit the ground. Fade. Deciding to take your stepfather's advice and take it easy this morning, you make your way th through the neighboring park. Away from the hustle and bustle of school, you can finally take some time for yourself. Of course, one doesn't want to get complacent as Nick, eager to sniff, sniff, Jesus, eager, eager to sniff at every object and water every bush, yeah, that's what he's doing, almost wraps his leash around your legs every ten minutes. Nick, I don't know how it is physically possible for you to hold that much. Cox his head. Rough. I'm I'm seventy percent bladder. You move ahead a few more feet, and then a stabbing pain shoots up from the back of your lower right leg. <coughs> your eyes close, but flashes of white still dance before your pupils, and the pain becomes a tightness, as if a vice like hand suddenly clenched around your leg. Ow! Damn it! You spy a nearby bench and humble your way to it upon sitting the pain subsides somewhat. Looking more closely at your leg, you see that it has contracted as if from a severe muscle cramp. The pain starts to ebb away when a shadow falls upon you, momentarily giving you relief from the sun. Unknown voice. Everything all right? You turn your head and see Tyrone Marshall smiling at you. From his current attire and the sheen of sweat glistening on his athletic frame, it looks like he was just out for a morning jog before seeing your distress. Mostly, yes, as long as I don't get another leg cramp, I should be fine. Tyrone's eyes momentarily follow the length of your leg and his cheeks redden slightly before he focuses on your face again. Ouch, I hate when that happens. It helps to stretch and drink plenty of fluids. Preparation makes sense if I was to run a marathon, but to take my dog for a walk? Fair enough. Tyrone takes a seat beside you, and he glances toward the lake where Nick is busy digging in the soft bank, and presumably eventually killing that duck back there. I'm a little surprised to see you here, actually. I mean, I thought you graduated. I still have a couple months before I go to my new job, so you might see me around for a while yet. Tyrone briefly glances at you from the corner of his eye, and you can see his lips twitch slightly upwards. So what will you be doing in the meantime? Nothing much, though I will be doing the job hunt thing, at least for something temporarily. A new job before your new job? <laughs> I guess that works. You know, if you really need something, there's an opening or two within the athletic department. I doubt the cheerleading squad has openings for graduates. Unless you poison some cheerleaders, no. <laughs> but w would you poison some cheerleaders? They, they, they've, they've been asking, it's getting kind of awkward. No, it's pretty brain dead work, like prick, like pick, pricking up, geez, like picking up uniforms and what have you. It certainly sounds easy enough. You know, brain dead work. I can handle that. I'm brain dead. Tyrone starts to say something else when the basketball player suddenly lets out a slight oof after Nix lands lands on his lap. The dog takes a deep sniff of Tyrone's arm and then and proceeds to drown him in kisses. Okay, so I guess this is one of the side relationships going on. And on that picture, um, how is the dog drowning him in kisses when he's facing the same way Tyrone is? It's like kiss kiss, turn around, yeah, yeah he's mine. Kiss, kiss, kiss. Uh, back the fuck off. Uh. Um, could I get a little help here? Do we pull Nick's leash, offer Nick a treat, or pick Nick up? It's 
So unless I'm mistaken, uh, as far as active people in the chat, we have all ladies. So, ladies, what do you think? I'll have to be the tiebreaker if uh, it comes to that. Okay, offer a treat. My arm. You reach into your pocket and pull out a small treat. You give it a shake back and forth. Time for nom noms. Nick looks up at Tyrone, gives a slight whine, and then drops down to get his treat. <laughs> Grins. I see your dog has his priorities straight. With your dog in hand, you see Nick has left mud all over Tyrone's clothes. Tyrone wipes the worst of it off, flicking it away with an easy gesture. I'm so sorry, he's never done that to someone before. Don't worry about it, it was going to be washed after my workout anyways. Speaking of which, I have to get going. If you're interested in the job, just be sure to come by the athletic department. I better get back, I have at least an another hour on the in on the court. Take care. Lines. Did that one for me. Tyrone smiles and bends down to scratch behind his ears. Don't worry, I won't forget to say goodbye to you as well. When, when, I, when I first read this line, I thought it was Tyrone scratching behind his own ears. With Tyrone's departure, you decide to return home. Fortunately, Nick doesn't give any fuss until you're near the cemetery. What? When he stops and starts to sniff the ground. While you try to gain his attention, he is quite focused on whatever scent he caught. Something catch your interest, boy? Pet cemetery? Nick continues to ignore you, much more interested by whatever smell caught his interest. Suddenly, he raises his hand, cocks his ears back, and looks into the cemetery. You follow his gaze and see a figure move among the tombstones. Bark. Huh? Nick unexpectedly rushes forward. Surprised, your grip loosens just enough that the leash handle slips from your hand, and Nick suddenly squeezes through the gaps in the cemetery's wrought iron fence. Damn it, Nick! Get here, back here, right this moment! Fine, just for that, you're not sleeping at the foot of my bed. Paying no attention to your calls, Nick soon disappears among the assorted headstones. Cursing, you look left and see a gate leading into the cemetery. You enter and move in the rough direction you last saw Nick. If not for the fence behind you, you see how easy one could get lost amongst the graves. Yeah. Even if you know Nick's a dog, it still sounds kind of bad. Oh, and I'd love to see somebody have, like, jumped the fence and just end up in this open plot right here. Where, like, Nick goes right through the fence. As you stand amidst the multitude of graves, a slight chill creeps along the edge of your spine. For a moment, it feels like you are being watched, although you don't notice anything other than statuary looking at you. Then you hear a familiar sharp bark coming from your right. Nick wags his tail as you move towards him. That is when you notice a sheet of paper and a long black implement on the ground. Closer examination of the paper shows an old angel along with some dates on it, and you realize it is a charcoal rubbing of the nearby grave. Oh my, K Nick, I think you scared whoever did this off. Someone was in here doing some heavy, heavy rubbing and you interrupted them. You bend down to take a hold of Nick's leash once more when you hear someone clear their throat behind you. Ahem. <coughs> so why are you following me? <coughs> you whirl around and see Sabrina behind you, a stern look flitting across her face. I wasn't. I was just chasing the dog. I hope he didn't frighten you. Sabrina's face softens and the corner of her mouth edges into a smile. I don't frighten easy. I just thought you were... Well, it isn't important. Is something wrong? Maybe I could help. Who said I needed help? You're acting rather jumpy, you know. Sabrina's eyes narrow when she crosses her arms. Just like that. I get it. Dad sent you to do his spying, didn't he? He's just concerned. When did you get all defensive? Well, how can he not be worried? Sabrina's eyes close, and she takes a deep breath. Her eyes didn't close. I'm sorry, but you're going to have to trust me when I say I can't tell you what's going on. Trust her, press her for more information, let it go for now. 
clearly everything's perfectly alright. Choices, choices, choices. Okay, Miss Kitten says let it go. I am not doing the uh, Frozen reference. Let it go. Very well. I won't say anything about this for now. Yeah, she could she could do it. Her hair's too short though. That's the only thing. Thanks. Although, um, if you give her a bit different clothing and dye that blue, she could uh, be a dead ringer for uh, Chloe Price from Life is Strange. I like the charcoal rubbing. Anything special about it? Not really. I just like the design of the angel and want to use it for reference. Sabrina bends down and rolls up the piece of paper while slipping the charcoal into her pocket. She then cocks her head and looks you in the eye. I couldn't help but overhear you this morning. If you want a job, well, the music shop has an opening if you're interested. Perhaps, what would the job require? Selling music. Nothing special, some stocking, some customer service, like cleaning. Any negatives? No, we're not developing film. Well, I would probably be your supervisor. I hardly think being with you is a negative. Sabrina's cheeks redden, but she bullies on. Punch. You might think differently if you join up. Speaking of which, I have the morning shift at the store. I'll catch you after work. Sabrina scratches the back of her neck. Silence reigns for a few more minutes, and off in the distance you can hear a groundskeeper start up a riding lawnmower. Yeah, because there's so much grass to be trimmed right around here. I wish you and Dad would stop worrying. All it would take is a few... It wouldn't do any good. Listen, I have to get going. I'll talk to you later. Sabrina gives her hand a gentle squeeze, but her grip feels like a vice. She then turns around and disappears among the headstones. You leave the cemetery and start making your way back home when you notice, notice the leash is gone taut. Looking down, you see Nick standing stock still, his gaze focused on a person down the street. Nick's hackles are raised, and he is giving a low, if dangerous, growl. Yes, Nick lead the way. You follow Nick's gaze and spy the object of his ire, Ashley Harrington. For as long back as you can remember, Nick never did like Ashley, who, which made it awkward when she used to be your babysitter. Ashley becomes aware of your presence and gives an enthusiastic wave in your direction. Hey, it's great to see you! Well, uh, hello there, uh, Belle from Beauty and the Beast. Ashley closes the distance between the two of you, a large smile on her face, then she stops as she finally notices Nick. Thank you for, thank you for uh, reading the lines for me, Nick. Ashley. Da, da, da. Caitlin. Sorry, Ashley. <sighs> Don't apologize. He's never liked me, even after I gave him half a bag of treats. I remember that night. Your homework looked like confetti when he was done. Fortunately, he was all bloated from eating so many treats, so all you had to do was bounce him down the stairs. That was the only time I got a D in an English class. Mr. Matthias said I could have been more creative than using a dog ate my homework on why I didn't finish my assignment. Ashley takes a tentative step forward when Nick lets out a loud yelp, and then he huddles in close to your heels, trying to keep you between him and Ashley. So what are you up to now that you're done with school, applying to graduate school? I'm all schooled out for the moment. It feels nice to have no homework. I know the feeling. I have two more years to go myself. Well, what are you doing on this fine day, besides protecting me from grievous bodily harm? Nick growls once more, reinforcing Ashley's statement. God damn, Nick, Nick's gonna become like... Nick's gonna murder everybody by the time this is over. I can see it happening. I'm just relaxing, but we'll soon be looking for a summer job. Oh, how's that going? I have a couple ideas, but nothing certain yet. If you need money badly, perhaps... Um, you know what? Never mind. Are you going to try and convince her to be a hooker? Never mind what? Well, I was going to say that a couple people quit where I work and they are looking to fill their spots. Sweet, so what is the job? 
Well, um, that is sort of why I said never mind. In retrospect, I shouldn't have said anything. Whatever it is, it can't be that bad. Not unless I'm transporting illegally harvested kidneys. Oh, damn it, you guessed. No, nothing like that. It's just, well, I do some dancing on the side. Something tells me this isn't tap dancing. Well, not me. Bridget, on the other hand, uh, sorry to go off track. Yes, I'm an exotic dancer. Hello. So, I would become one as well? No. However, we've had some other staff members move on. One of our bartenders ran off to Las Vegas with one of our bouncers, leaving us in a bit of a lurch. Ashley goes quiet as you feel her gaze go up and down your body. So, if you think you'd have a problem working at a strip club, you know, getting ogling glances worse than mine. Um, uh, okay. Choices. No, never. Let me think about it. It's an honest living. I don't remember for sure, but I'm pretty certain that if we say no, never, it blocks off um, Ashley as a uh, possible romance candidate. I can't swear to that, though. So, what do you all think? Two seems like the most diplomatic. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there is that. Just fob her off, so say no, never. Okay. So, I get to be the tiebreaker. Um, no? Wait, what do you mean? Oh, number, say number two. I didn't know what fob or off meant. I thought it meant, you know, tell her to piss up a rope or something. Okay, well then good, number two it is. Give me some time to think about it. There's a lot of things to consider. I understand. Not everyone would be comfortable working in such an environment. Ashley looks at her wrist and does a slight take. Oh my god, my wrist has been broken this whole time! Will you look at the time? I'm sorry to cut this short, but I have to run. I have to go to the clinic and get my broken wrist set. As you continue glancing down the street, you feel a by now familiar tautness of the leash. Glancing at Nick, you find his head is cocked and he tries to pull you down what appears to be an abandoned alley. That's right, uh, Nick, advance the plot. What is it, boy? Do you see something? It will have to wait. We're late enough as it is. We don't want them to unleash the hounds to find us. Nick gives an imploring glance up at you and gives a soft plaint of whine when the air is broken by the sound of a large crash and a loud cry of, Ow! What he said. Oh my, that sounded painful. All right, Nick, since you noticed it, lead the way. Oh, now he doesn't want to do it. Fine, rough. Nick lurches forward, this time leading you through a small maze of alleys when the memory of a dream crosses your awareness. Seeing odd dog from morons. You could swear you heard the stomping of feet, the rushing of fear, as you tried to escape from your nightmarish pursuers. You glance over your shoulder and, much to your relief, find the place is empty save for you, Nick, and one other person. A young blonde man you know from the university. At the moment he is lying amongst the ruins of a broken crate. Victor, are you alright? Victor gives a quick cursory glance down his body and offers you a slight smile. Other than some minor lacerations, I appear to be fine. You reach down and offer your hand. Victor's face blushes slightly, but he takes all but he takes offered a pending. But he takes offered a pending? Shouldn't it be appendage? He takes your appendix that you offered, and you feel a slight tingle in your fingers and notice the hair standing up on the back of your hand. Hey, it's Egon! Pity, I didn't mean to compromise the structural integrity of the box. I'm sorry, I was just uh, sleeping inside my Faraday cage. At least you weren't injured. I don't think I could have carried you out of here. Victor pushes his glasses up slightly and shrugs. I've suffered greater injuries in my investigations. This is minor at best. 
What brought you out here, anyway? Victor takes a look at the abandoned building, and that's when you notice several cameras hidden throughout the structure. My father was considering purchasing this property, but was unsure if it would have been worth the investment. There were stories of, well, it doesn't really matter. Jokingly, they could use this for Halloween. It looks like it could be haunted. <laughs> Victor tenses up, then gives a minor cough. <laughs> I didn't find the presence of spectral activity. Yeah, this is gone. Seeing as you're fine, I'm going to head on out. Still, I appreciate your assistance. Uh, speaking of which, if you happen to know someone who is in need of employment this summer, I could use their help. Wow, this is just total serendipity, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's like it's like a mix of Egon, like Harold Ramis Egon, but the blonde hair of Egon from the uh, the cartoon series. Uh, hmm. I might have someone in mind. What kind of job is it? Nothing major, just someone to help me in my investigations. If you know someone who's interested, just have them call me. Who am I going to call? Victor glances skyward and scrunches his eyes. It looks like rain. You follow Victor's gaze and see a vast expanse of blue broken up by just a couple of small, fluffy white clouds. Yeah, seriously. Are you sure there is no there is no dark cloud in sight and the news didn't predict any rain? I started to complain that there was no rain. Are you calling me a liar? Whoa. Okay, our choices are of course not. Are you blind? Maybe you got hit a little too hard. Well, this took a turn. Well, there's a pretty obvious connection there. Uh, three. Maybe you got hit a little too hard. Victor, you might want to get yourself examined, you know, just to be on the safe side. I mean, you did hit rather hard. How do you know? You know, I mean, you saw him on the floor, but you don't know how, how hard he hit. You weren't there. I appreciate your concern for my well-being, but I shall be fine. So now he's saying, great, so he went from uh, Egon Spengler to Ferris Bueller. I shall offer you my goodbye. I don't want to be caught outside when the storm hits. With a slight wave of his hand, Victor goes down another part of the alley and then disappears from sight. You've had quite the adventure, but it's time to head home. Nick starts to pace alongside you once more when you hear a faint rumble in the skies. The sound of distant thunder. Not to be confused with the delicate sound of thunder, a great Pink Floyd album. He's a very antisocial dog. You haven't been making your way back home for more than 15 minutes when the day suddenly darkens. Looking skyward, ominous clouds have rolled in. Ruff, ruminous rouds. Re redder reek relter. Suddenly, your eyes go temporarily blind as white light fills the air and a crack of thunder rumbles close by. Yeah, I'm right there with you, Nick. Heavy drops of rain start to fall, and within a few minutes, you are soaked to the bone. Nick continues to whine, lifting a paw in supplication until you pick him up in your arms. You huddle underneath the awning of the Haunted Cafe, a local coffee shop and bakery purported to be haunted. I never would have guessed from the name. Meanwhile, you see a figure running down the street, her clothes clinging to her body. You recognize her as Mrs. Murphy. You took a class or two of hers to fill out electives back when you were in college. Nadia. Damn, it's raining like cats and dogs. <laughs> Amusedly. Oh, very well. It's raining like cats. Are you satisfied? No! I, I imagine Misfit isn't either. <laughs> yeah, we'll just have to split the difference and say it's raining like pandas. I can't say I wasn't warned. Victor said a tempest was coming. Why, well, yes, here's a copy of Shakespeare's The Tempest. Bonk! That boy has a sixth sense about this stuff, that's for sure. Did he say how long it was going to last? 
Nope, Miss Murphy. Please, now that you've graduated, please call me Nadia. If you say so, Mrs. Mernadia. Mrs. Mernadia sounds like uh, Namor the Submariner's uh, other daughter. It takes a little getting used to, I know. Nadia looks briefly skyward and then shakes her head. Rather than catch our death of a cold, why don't we go in, on in? That sounds delightful, but I don't think they'll let me bring Nick in, and I'm not going to pretend he's a he's service animal. Yes, he helps me with my diction. Trust me, they won't make a fuss. <laughs> hey, uh, look at it this way. At least, um, you know, she held off. I know, I know some people who didn't. Nadia steps to the side, opens the door with one hand. With an exaggerated flourish of her arm. After you. Kasumi! Welcome to the Haunted Cafe! I am the, I am the daughter of uh, Toto from uh, Art of Fighting. I hope you don't mind me bringing in my dog. Dog? Oh, is that one of those new electronic pets? It looks so realistic. Okay. They need to work on the bark, though. Make it sound more realistic. You cast a slight glance at Nadia's direction, but she gives a slight shrug of her shoulders. Sorry, I didn't mean to get distracted by your toy. Feel free to stay in here until the rain eases up. If you want something, just holler. I'll have one hot chocolate heavy on the whipped cream. What are you having? Uh, do we want hot chocolate as well? Coffee or nothing? And while we're at it, do we want, um, to educate Kasumi on what actual dogs are? Hot chocolate? Hot chocolate, yeah. I often make, like, Swiss Mips uh, hot chocolate with a Keurig. Just, like, pour the packet in the cup and then uh, just run hot water through it. And then usually put some mini marshmallows in it. It is so good. Chocolate 2. Good choice. <laughs> As you can probably guess, hot chocolate is one of my weaknesses. Nadia takes a seat at a nearby booth and she looks at the sudden downpour out the window. I'm a little surprised to see you, actually. Once they graduate, most students... Leave? If only I could. Oh, you still live at home? Blushes. Yeah, it's only until my job kicks in, but that's a couple months down the road. I don't mean to pry, but what are you doing in the meantime? Hopefully me. Oh, I intend to get a little something to tide me over. I have a few solid job leads, at least. Nadia puts her hands together and closes her eyes. Well, if you want one more offer, I could use an assistant. I'm working on a new book, and I could use some help. Um... I think, it, I think it's ca more because she's down on herself for, for still living at home. I don't know. I, I, I haven't really gotten a vibe that anyone's coming down on her for, uh, for still being there other than herself. What sort of help? Oh, it's a mixed bag, to be honest, but it pays well. After about ten more minutes of conversation, you see that the rain is finally coming to an end. Nadia pulls out a napkin and writes a series of numbers on it. Hey, we getting those digits! Listen, I have to get going, but if this sounds like something you might want to do, give me a call. In one day, five different job offers. I'm back! Thank goodness. I admit I was a little worried when that rainstorm hit and you didn't get back. I thought Nick got loose. You know how he gets with the smallest hint of thunder. Yeah, I know a couple of dogs like that. Nick was a total sweetheart, weren't you, boy? Weren't you? Digging in the cemetery like a total sweetheart. Pull, pulling out those femurs like a total sweetheart. Yeah, that's right. Cover for me. You bend down and run a hand through Nick's fur and he gives out a contented pant. I happened to run into a few friends and spend some time catching up. That's why I was so late. I meant for that to sound more like a pant and less like a, you know, like, <laughs> obscene phone call mourn, or moan, rather. 
So my apologies about that. Wow. Uh, that's a problem. You never know how some of these sound effects are going to sound until you make them. And then it's, uh, then it's on there forever. Mm. Oh, speaking of friends, someone named Kasumi called. She must have lost my number again. Then how the hell did she call? Yeah, I was going to go out with a couple of friends tonight, if that's all right. You don't have to ask my permission, although if you need a ride home, you know I would never do something like that. I know, I know, you can't blame a father for worrying. Yeah, but nothing was actually mentioned in the cafe that she knew Kasumi. And if she lost her number, how the hell did she call? And I appreciate it. 